Okay, team. All right. Sorry for the delay. So sad. No, I just, you know. Okay, we're going to talk now. <laughs> Meaning the royal we. Okay. Which is a good we. <coughs> All right. Hey, man. All right. Um, okay. What are we doing? So we are going to be talking more about this uh, allocation of facilities thing, which is a beautiful problem. Dave loves it. We'll talk about it. But we do have three papers we're going to write on this, right? Yep. Yeah. Which took a long time to figure out. But it's, it, there is a deep connection between the, we think, between the hot model and, and this allocation of facilities. So we'll get to that. All right. So the rumor is true. There's an extra question in um, assignment seven. <coughs> Again, you have not, it's not due tomorrow. Let's bring it up. There's a website. I oh, should use the website. Uh, okay. And it is, it should be there. If it's not there, it should be there. It is there? You're so happy, aren't you? Yeah, so what this is about estimating the rare. So this, the idea is, uh, so this is from the Google data set, for example, right? Which, so it's using the thing we started with in the first assignment. Um, you have the number of words of a certain frequency, right? And the log thing and the log 10 here, right? So this went like this, but it started at, 200, because Google made a decision to, you know, when they put this data set up, to truncate it at the, because as we know, right, the, there's an unbelievable number of these things out here. Half of the lexicon will be words that, word thi these aren't words anymore, these are just things, blemishes on paper, right, this is really getting at the outer edges of things that have appeared once, right, the hapax legoma, which is kind of ridiculous in this thing. So. Anyway, the idea for this question is simply to extrapolate back and kind of figure out how many words are in the whole thing. So you could do, you know, this is something you can do in general. And with power laws, it's a kind of a nice thing. The next, there'll be a few other questions to come on power laws. One will be, as you sample from a power law distribution, so it takes a while for it to fill in, right? So as you're sampling and you look at your distribution, it's going to grow like this. It's going to fill out like this, right? So the earthquake that you experience you know, early on, there'll be some little tremors. This is the 100-year flood, the 1,000-year flood, the 10th, right, that idea. It takes a long while, but there's still randomness. It can be bad for you to sample these bigger and bigger things, right? So the idea is, with the number of samples, how does the largest event that you've sampled grow? And it grows very slowly if you're from a Gaussian, taking from a Gaussian distribution or exponential, incredibly slowly, right? This is a um, extremal statistics, which is a beautiful, beautiful bit of mathematics, but we're just going to do a simple thing to figure out how that grows. And then the last one is the 99%, 1% thing, right? 80-20 rule. How does that actually work with power laws? Because that's what it's supposed to be based on. So you can play around with that, right? How does the exponent gamma connect to 80-20 rules? All right. So that'll be in other assignments. So you're welcome. <laughs> Jeremy was just thrilled, so um, glad to have made you happy. Uh, and so I have to leave by 2.15 today, but we'll, I'll be over there for a little while. But again, no assignment due tomorrow. But there is, you should send in your next installment of your um, projects, right? You've got the format for how that should be labeled, uh, basically just changing the date on it. So you're updating a file that you're building on this thing, all right? So that's something that's due tomorrow. That's just a uh, document. Yeah, like I've made a terrible mistake is a good add to that, right? Here are the horrible things that went wrong. You know, I mean, that's okay. More of a little bit of a lab report to start with, and then you polish it up as you go along. Right? The true trajectory of science is I'm going to figure this thing out, and you figure this thing out. Yeah. Um, well, it's, but you're building towards the final product. So anything that helps you get along in that direction, right? So it could be at this point you're. Yeah, you're just describing everything like that, right? You, that's, a, that's a good base to build in. If you know, and you do, I think, right? You have a good sense of things, so, yeah. All right. I know you want to come and talk to me more about it and so on. Lots of great projects, as you saw. Um, very exciting. Um, but um, happy for you to kind of go wild with these things. All right. So, 
Okay, that's good. Um, <coughs> this is an important psychological break, but um, I just want to put this here. Has anyone seen this? Nice little thing that got spread around. So the, the neighbors in this is an apartment building were complaining about the noise during the day. And so they set up a nanny cam. And it turns out that uh, this is what was happening. <laughs> I don't know if we've got it. So basically it would sing. Do you oh, know it's got what an the ad. number one killer of tech? That looks like Arnold Schwarzenegger. <laughs> <laughs> there's GIFs. I don't know, that's so sad. I tried to... Oh, there's the ad, there's the ad break there. That was my mistake. They let you get in, and then if you want to watch the whole thing... Right. That was very cool of you. <laughs> Basically... <laughs> yeah, this goes on for a minute, and the dog sings. So that explains what was going on. It was just trying to be like its, its uh, companions. It's pretty great. All right. To feel, we need a few of these things to make us feel happy. All right. That's my tea. tea. Okay, so we're going to talk about three papers, I think, in the end. It will be, the first one will be, and I'll mention a few others, but the first one is by uh, this character, uh, Ed Stefan. As I said, published in Science in 1977, and he's a sociologist that sort of came out of nowhere, I think, at the time. Um, and... Uh, He's, he's, we're going to have a actual, you know, a little mathematical um, bit of work to go through based on this idea of minimal effort. And so, you know, some people really take this to the limit. They think everyone's lazy, basically, and everything that we do is, you know, minimal. But, um, you know, and you, you can try. I mean, certainly you can go and try to explain all sorts of human behavior by that um, presumption. All right. Okay. So, um, yeah, subnational boundaries is the idea. Okay. So let's see if we can get this together. So we're going to have, so you might want to draw a little picture of this. So we've got an area A, and there's a population P. And you, we're not going to worry about the variation too much within the area, right? That's not what it is. So we're looking at, and if you'll let me jump back a little bit, what he's going to focus on is one, like just one of these cells, right? So one of these cells. And of course, there is variation in population in here. But he's just going to say, let's imagine there's sort of a uniform thing in there, and then that will help us sort of picture, put everything together. Trying to get a, uh, how the... So, okay, this is an important thing to understand. Let me get to it. Da, 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 da. Right, we're trying to prove this again, just to remind you, right, that the facility... De or pr you know, show an argument for why this makes sense. Facility density scales sublinearly with respect to the population density, right? So this goes up. This goes up as well, but to a power two-thirds. And there's this suggestion, uh, you know, we, we, if we think like physicists, this is d over d plus one, where d is the dimension that we live in, which is two dimensions, right? So that's the sort of Lua. Okay, so let's see if we can get this thing to work. So I don't need to do too much of this, but the idea is you'd have a little... Is it this thing? Yeah. I have to wake this up, I think. Okay, so we have one center, right? So some area, there's area A, and there's some population in here, P, and so sort of, we just sort of roughly think it's distributed, um, this is population P, distributed, you know, approximately sort of uniformly. So this is a local analysis of some bigger, right? This fits in, this guy fits into some big thing like this. Right, whatever it is. And these are all, there's little centers inside them all. So that's important, so we'll put a little whatever it is. I guess I put those crosses for something. This is some little whatever it is. Uh, we're thinking of these as public good facilities, right? These are things that have been put down maybe by a government or some sort of central planning, which is interesting, right? Sort of goes against the idea of the complex systems thing, but... Um, We'll see how that varies as we get into private ones where you've got different incentives. So there's this one public good. It's a, it's a school or maybe a um, fire station, something like that. But I think the good framing, we had the sinks and source confusion, right? So maybe to think about this as this is a place that people are trying to get to, maybe on a daily basis. 
yeah, so that one, maybe don't use that, but I mean, it's, they, they're going to be allocated, and, and police stations are going to be allocated in interesting ways too, right? That you have to service the thing. But if you want to use the frame of, you know, people want to get to this thing and they have to get back. So someone lives here and they're going to drive in and out. And the best way to think about, and this is not a bad principle for, for life in general, right, is, is, is not so much, is time. Time is your great resource. Do you have access to your time? What's being, how is your time being used up? Um, so we're going to have a couple of pieces. This center has to be maintained. Maybe you, know, you could think, say, taxes do this, or you know, it's volunteer, whatever it is. Um, but let's say that the society is functioning okay, and they, they don't want to burn everything down. So taxes are kind of okay, right? And so that's, you can think of it as coming in from that system. Um, there's an average dis uh, travel distance, and then there's some typical speed. So you know, you could think about how this works when you have subways and buses and then trains outside of those, right, and cars. Like, how, does, how do people, um, you know, start to change uh, how things can be structured as a result of their different modes of travel? Um, and so we'll assume isometry, right? So as we um, scale out, the typical distance will be A to the half, right? So some obviously live close to the... Right, so some obviously live, they're distributed somewhat uniformly, as I said, right? So some of these people, it's very easy to get back and forth. But, um, you know, and you could do this for a, a, a circle or a sphere. The typical distance, uh, do I have a, I don't think I have, so the typical distance, and we're all going to say they're in, car, you know, they're in cars or walking or whatever it is, that's fine, um, scales like A to the half. Right, it's the linear scale in this thing. Fair enough. So that introduces something interesting already. So let's put these pieces together, right? So the, this is the typical distance that people are traveling. This is their average speed. Um, <coughs> and so that typical distance is an A to the half. There's some typical speed. There's some you know, <coughs> constant proportionality based on shapes and things. But basically, this is here. Um, OK. And then we're not going to have, as we scale across different areas, Velocity is not going to change in a big way. But that is something that you can introduce if you had you know, high-speed trains and all sorts of things where you, where you get that effect. All right. So that's a little setup. That's part of it. So this is, so this is getting towards, this is the cost, right? We're trying to build a cost, right? This is a cost for running this thing. Um, and so now we're going to maintain it. <coughs> and this I've sort of tried to reframe a little bit of what was done in the paper. Um, think about personal hours per day, right? There's some maintenance of this thing, and we can, you can think about this and see if this makes sense. But I'm just following this method. We'll see how it generalizes. So, um, so the burden of maintenance is, is shared out, right? There's just some amount of time that is required per day, right? Many people working on it and so on to run it in all sorts of ways. Um, that's this quantity tau. And we're going to divide that up by people, right? So you have to, you know, you, you can imagine this is that time gets turned into money and you're paying for it, whatever it is. You would think there'd be some scaling here that's being hidden, right? So as the population gets bigger, tau should get bigger, but that's um, something we're going to be a little bit careful with, I guess. Uh, the idea is roughly it's divided out by people, so it's going to be, there's an inverse relationship with the, the cost and the population, right? So as the population goes up in your area, um, the, you pay less. Yeah. Um, so that's going to seem a little funny, right? Because you think that might actually just scale, not scale at all, right? It might be just that the cost of maintenance uh, is, is, is independent of population, right? The, the amount you as an individual pay is the same. Okay. But this is the argument. Uh, okay, and then we have, so we're trying to get to our density thing, so we're going to put population is density times area, right? And, the dent and we're, again, uniform, uniform sort of assumption, an assumption of uniformity here. All right, so we've got those pieces. Uniform density. And then, so this is the total time cost per person, right? So there's this piece here, which is the, uh, the travel time piece, and then this is the um, we're turning it into time, but this is, you know, you pay money, that becomes time. Um, just so these have the same units. And I'm not sure if that's really true in the original paper, but that's oh, not bad. You can, so you can see that there's an area on the bottom here, and there's going to be area on the top here because we <coughs> structured it that way. So that's this piece. 
right? So we're saying that the typical distance anyone travels is going to go like this, a to the half. So this is, so this, if you've done, right, a little bit of calculus, this is sitting very nicely as something we can differentiate, right? We want to find where this is, uh, you know, we want to optimize this, right? We want to minimize this. And because we have this nice structure with an a to the uh, positive power and then a to a negative power, it's going to work out, right? Little calculation with respect to a. So just a derivative. Let's see how these things work. Make sure we've got it right. So um, let's see. So there is a, yep, yeah, we're just going to uh, do the derivative here. So a to the half, we get a half comes down the front, right? So it's a 2, a to the minus a half. So it's on the bottom. Uh, this one here, OK, I guess what is it? OK, and then we're just differentiating this. It's a to the minus 1, so the minus 1 comes out the front. Uh, and then uh, a squared, right? a to the minus 2. So OK? OK, and then the, re the point I was trying to make before, this is a positive exponent and a negative exponent. So this introduces a, a negative between them, right? And they were both positive quantities to start with. OK, so we can set this equal to 0. Rearrange things, which you could make sure I've done the right thing. So we're just going to rearrange things. We're going to have, um, if we put this over on this side and then multiply a squared, right? Then we'll have an a to the 3 halves over here. And then we're going to move the c, so there's these pieces here. There'll be a c will come down here. The 2v will go up to the top, right? So that's over here. Tau was already there. Rho population was here. And then this was a to the 3 halves, so we're going to make it a to the 2 thirds. a to the 3 halves to the 2 thirds, which is just a to the power of 2 thirds. <coughs> OK, just rearranging, getting a by itself. All right, so what's this? So this is actually, this is density to the minus 2 thirds, the population density. And then we just make this simple observation that the way we've set it up is that the local density of facilities is just 1 over the area, right? There's one of them in the area. So 1 over a is the local density of facilities. So we just have to flip this upside down and we get this. So a number of things go into this, right? So one is you know, just this idea of isometry and scaling, which we talked about way, way back. And then this, so that's a, that seems not bad, and that's, that's your cost that is associated with you getting to this facility and back. Uh, that makes sense, right? So as area goes up, this becomes more punishing, but this helps, right? It costs less to run the whole thing uh, per person. Uh, but I'm, I th you know, I guess I have this written down, but this is this seems this should feel this one feels a little debatable, right? You know, if you increase the population that's going to the one center by a factor of ten, that center has to, you know, presumably get bigger. In a, in, and it's what's what it's suggesting is, yeah, <coughs> that it really doesn't. Anyway, so it should at least n grow maybe sublinearly, as we've seen with a lot of these city scaling things. So it's not bad. That's a little, little uh, you know, s simple argument. It's, it does not, right, we don't, we're not thinking about anything, any of these other parts, right? We're not worried about any of these things over here or thinking about it in a bigger context. And so that's the, that's the challenge that uh, you'll see in the next slides where we try to fix this up. Okay, so as I said, maintenance is supposed to be independent of population, pretty weird. Um, You may not want to read this, but I think the final chapter is quite interesting to read about sociological laws. And he sort of does a good job, really, of trying to lay out, I don't know if I have it. Yeah. Yeah, sociological laws. And I, obviously, I can't dig into this too much. But um, there's this initial effort to talk about social physics, right? So which is a controversial kind of term now because it got tied to eugenics um, and, and sort of different senses of how you could control the world. Um, anyway, so, but talks about, and he has a couple of examples, and we've seen a few of these, right? So there's uh, Zipf's law here, the gravity model, which was in those um, extra Zipf notes, a um, couple of others. So he has the, you know, these, these density laws that we're talking about now, the center density, density, density laws, 
They're using, obviously, very different notation. D is population density. Uh, and they're all connected to each other. So C is center density, what we've called row facility. Uh, so he's, you know, saying, I mean, there seem to be these rough laws. These are, these are laws of structure. They're not laws of dynamics, really. Like, you know, there's not really a you know, prediction of, of social phenomena. That's going to be a, a tough one for us to, to really ever get to. But I think eventually what we can get to is, um, you know, putting a sort of a, an envelope around what's possible to predict. Anyway, so this is a, this is a, if you're interested in this sort of thing, you should, well, grand theory, right? He's having a great time. Okay, good. Um, the readme, oh God, is that still around? Yeah. Yeah, this is the one where I mentioned the other day, where basically in here you see some stuff about, he was told that, uh, you know, the, the internet thing is not interesting. You should not focus on that. Okay. Kind of a big thing. Okay, so we're going to talk about cartograms. Uh, this is a this is a not, this is sort of a little bit of a sidebar of sorts, but it's a beautiful thing, and a very interesting challenge for geographers and um, other characters who have been trying to, you know, show how a population, uh, show, show a, how a quantity is reflected in a population, right? So somewhat uh, famously, I suppose, in the last uh, what is it now, a few decades. You know, the U.S. voting, right? It all looks red, pretty much. Um, and there's some blue edges to it. So there's sort of this visual misrepresentation, right? Because the population is uneven. But it looks, you know, from a straight, raw picture, um, very strong in one way. So, you know, that's, a, that's an emblematic example of a map that's not really, you know, conveying the information that well unless you like that information, right? So it's sort of, it can be used badly, right? So, um, and certainly misinterpreted um, willfully or not. I mean, absolutely, um, but, uh, uh, accidentally. So, uh, so how do you deal with that? And so people have had a number of ideas, right? You could split them all off and then like rescale things. Uh, I think a big thing that's changed in the last 10 years has been this move towards the little square, squares for everything, right? So the US turned into a, so we have one for our, And I don't have it right with me. I should. <laughs> I don't know why I'm doing it like that. It should be completing. Come on. Yep. We have one in here, right? So this is a. This is our lexical calorimeter thing. So um, which I don't need to talk about too much. But it, but basically, yeah. So you can roll it around, and you, this is a measure from Twitter, basically of uh, caloric balance, and it uh, it's ridiculous. It's ridiculous. Have I talked about this? In this class? All right, I'm going to talk about it. So this is, um, and then I'll get to the map and we'll get back to where we are. But this is uh, an absurd idea where we just said, well, what if we could take tweets about food and activity, phrases in this case, and turn them into calories? <laughs> so it's very silly. Basically, if someone says skiing, we'll say, well, what's an hour of skiing? You know, like we, we have a lookup table for that, right? Like people have measured these things. And then, you know, we also have like lying on the ground. So lying down is something that has been quantified in terms of energetic uh, output. Watching TV is a category. Watching TV slash movies. So what we did, we, we took quotes, uh, took phrases, but then also kind of put them together in lemmas, right? So, um, which was not easy. So no one actually tweets, you know, watching TV slash movies, but it's things that got into that box, right? Playing football, mowing the grass. Um, so eating is an activity for which we have a a score, right? Uh, I, maybe another time I'll show you some other maps that are associated with this, which are quite amusing. But, um, okay, so you have, let's say, let's go, all right, well, let's go to the bottom. So Mississippi's at, so there's, a, there's an ordering here based on caloric balance, which is what we sort of call calories out divided by calories in. We didn't do a, a subtraction thing because obviously this is a ridiculous measure and like a negative and a, we didn't want to convey negatives and zeros and positives. That seems bad. But this, the, here's the thing, this correlates with obesity rates very well, right? So, so it's everything, it's, you know, this is um, out divided by in. So Colorado is, um, yeah, relatively. At least what the tweets say with our ridiculous measure. 
Well, then you can look at it and see what Colorado's thing is. In Colorado, you know, they're very, um, okay, so there Colorado has, you know, and you can see some of these advertising things, right? So they talk about noodles more and less about chocolate candy, right? Less about cakes and cookies relative to everyone else. Then there's some enthusiasm for bacon, <laughs> which, which puts your, well, we'll get to Vermont, which, which pushes your caloric content up. You know, they talk about sh shrimp, um, they talk about shrimp more, and that's good because it's sort of, no, no, this is a, they talk about shrimp less, right? And that would have helped them, but it didn't. All right, so this is um, kind of crazy, but then they have all these, generally, you know, they talk about reading, which is also very good, but it's not energetically, you know, consumptuous. Uh, but they've got all these things, so on the right, all the yellow ones are, you know, high energy things, running, skiing, da da da. Running's a very difficult word, right? It's the most common, it's the word with the most meanings now. Um, took over from set a while back, but they have less about eating, laying down, watching TV movies, talking on the phone. Um, they have more jazzercise, less showering. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's a crazy thing. It's, it's a little... Okay. Um, right, we're here, so I'm going to show you something. This is... Uh, we'll see, we'll see, we'll see Vermont, yes, yes. <laughs> Let me just quickly show you some slides. Uh, this is it. This is what's happened. What have I done? So this is something. This is a sort of long talk. I get, actually I gave this to the Santa Fe Institute in New York City. Anyway, uh, Panometrics. That's this piece here. Okay. So this is. Um, <coughs> okay. <laughs> These maps show you the words that came out at the top for all the states, right? You've seen a lot of these kind of maps probably, right, where the states are defined by the top of something. Um, so it's not a good story, basically. No one wins. No one wins. There's some, there were some, there's cookies and ice cream, but pizza was number two, right? So this is, of course, just all tweets, so it's people, it's services, Right, it's, we're, we're doing it that way, we're taking everything. Some bots might tweet about pizza, but you know, this is, the, this is what goes into humans, right? <laughs> While they watch TV and movies. So then you can look at, well, you know, so Vermont's you know, above average in terms of our score, and Colorado is, and then Mississippi and so on are low. So what, what's, what, which words are pushing them, which um, lemmas or which sort of activities and, and uh, foods are pushing them further away, right? Like which ones most strongly are pushing them away from the average. So that's what this is. So this is, this is more nuanced, right? So these ones are doing it running, running, dancing over here. Um, you know, so these are all very good. So we have skiing, skiing over here, mountain biking. It's good, well done, Maine. That's Maine. Using treadmill in Rhode Island. <laughs> while, watch, while, while watching Family Guy. And then Massachusetts just gets walking. But then it starts to go, right, so Connecticut's watching TV or movie, talking on the phone here, getting my nails done is New Jersey. <laughs> Any New Jersey people? Yeah, good. My wife's from New Jersey, this is great. Um, lay, simply laying down in Michigan. <laughs> because there's, there's watching TV or movie while lying down, that is a thing, they're not doing that. But then eating, that's the activity. I mean, obviously, it's a rough instrument, but it comes out with some music and sitting in Tennessee, but eating. <laughs> These guys are cleaning stuff off. I don't know, I know what's going on. What's that? Yeah, so this is a low... A yeah, this is a low... <laughs> I mean, right. Both things are happening at the same time, but you're not expanding a lot of... I don't know if it's a really hot sauce or something. Maybe. Maybe, Yeah. And then the top one, right, so the top one is, you know, what's the top food that's like, like really hurting them or helping them? So actually, Vermont's not great for, on the food side, so bacon, a lot of bacon. This is from 2012, so there's going to be a lot, lot of lobster in Maine, which isn't, you know, a high cut, but of course you put stuff on it. Um, but yeah, donuts, butter, a lot of chocolate candy, uh, noodles, which, you know, sort of more of a probably ad type things, and then, you know, this is going to be coming out of industry. But yeah, chocolate candy, peanut butter. Cheese, just simply cheese in Pennsylvania. <laughs> 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 well, 
Well, so, <laughs> okay. <laughs> you want it to be that. All right, let's go look at Vermont. So Vermont's, so, so you know, this ordering is, is useful, but it's hard to tell, right? right th we've colored them, so you can see that, you know, th that's helpful because you need to see the geography. But I think in general, you need these two kinds of plots together, right? And they're tied together, right? So if you run over some, if you run around on this thing, it shows you where it is, you know, in order on the bottom thing. So this was a nice thing. Um, all right, so Vermont has, right, so at the top is bacon. I know these are little, maybe a little. And then butter, cookie dough, coconut oil, cookies, right? So these are, and Girl Scout cookie, right? So then you've got some cheese, goat cheese, cheddar cheese. I don't know why that wasn't put together, but um, cheese, beef jerky. So these things are high calorie things. Then all the good, you know, these things are okay. So some of these don't work, right? We found it very hard to account for um, liquids, like, um, you know, soda, which should be there, but it's just a, that was a difficult one to kind of combine in some ways. Yeah, anyway, so, and over here it's skiing, snowboarding, you know, all these good, these things, sledding, right? They just talked about relatively more, playing dodgeball, I guess vacuuming, yeah, solid. These are things that are done less relatively, eating, right? All these things, getting my nails done. <laughs> See, attending church is debate. I mean, that can be a high, that can be, it depends on your church, right? That could be very mellow, <laughs> nothing is happening for you, you're just receiving, or you could be very engaged. So, um, especially if there's glossolalia. Okay. Um, all right. Anyway, I know that was a detail, I'm very sorry, but these kinds of maps, um, have become quite good, right? Because they take away the size of the thing. I mean, it depends what you're trying to show, but they do. And, and so people have moved this. There's an, a very nice version, which is a hexagonal one as well. Okay. Because hexagons are the best, right? You have some trouble with, like, there's just going to be some errors in here, right? There's just going to be some stuff that doesn't feel right. So let's see. So where did, yeah, see, this is a bit strange, right? Yeah, they kind of got, folded in this way and yeah. Yeah, so they're not on this one. We didn't record them for this, which is just the contiguous US. But yeah, yeah, the four corners, rock solid, right? That's gonna work out. But um, <laughs> it's gonna go to pieces over here. But it also helps with um, you know with maps because you know we have DC for example. And if you have a normal map and you have little rollovers, like to get to DC it's like I mean, you, you've built this thing, and you're like, God, I can't get the, to get it to pop up and show you what's going on. So anyway, much better. Anyway, that's, that's, that's cool. All right, but so prior to that sort of taking off, um, I want to talk about these maps that Newman invented, and I think are pretty cool. So let's see. I think this is, look at that, it's too big. Do you see that? It's just, and now I can't do it, right? I don't think I can, you know, I had the little, all right, I'll just delete these. Wow. Oh, is that the problem? No? Weird. All right, who knows? Okay, cartograms. All right, so this is the same problem. Uh, now it's at the world scale, right? And so you can, right, there are about 200 countries trying to put them into squares and make it, you could sort of do it, maybe, yeah. Hexagons would be better. Um, everyone's always surprised, right, there are at least, what, 50 countries? How many in Africa? About 50? Yeah. Uh, my uh, daughter, who's going to, what's she going to, she's going to turn 15 tomorrow. So she had this thing a couple of years ago, where she could remember all the countries and all the capitals and just list them out of thin air, which was bonkers. Um, anyway, interesting child. Uh, so, <coughs> so, uh, Right, it doesn't represent things very well. So, f so here's a, uh, I'll explain how this is done, but this is a rescaling of sorts, trying to keep things together. I think, so in this case, Antarctica was just treated as, as um, C, so it probably didn't change, yeah. Does it, look the, does it look the same? Yeah, so there's a reason, okay, and the re right, and I'll keep, I'll keep the original one here, you know what, but the reason is, so what's happened is um, there's an average population, um, an average population density, right, for the whole of the world, for the land mass that you have, so you measure that, and then you set the oceans to have that population density. That seems a bit weird, and we're going to set that population density to be uniform everywhere else here, 
and then run a diffusion operator on the whole thing. So you imagine now that each country, maybe I'll just sort of try to illustrate and then we'll have some pictures. So you've got the average population of, so imagine you put an average density here of people and then you just sort of stack up or diminish the uh, height of these things, where you imagine there's a 3D thing here, uh, according to its population, right? So the population density of India is high, so it would stick out. It would be this kind of column sticking out, India shape. And then you just let diffusion happen, right? So stuff's just going to kind of fall and schmooze out, and those borders are going to push uh, into the other areas. So Canada, which is second biggest, right? It's big, a lot of Canada, yeah? Fantastic place to invest in, obviously, with global warming. Um, uh, goes, whoop, disappears, right? It gets, gets uh, squeezed up, Australia gets squeezed up, Indonesia, over 230 million maybe, I think, 240 million, very, yeah. Grows enormously, India obviously, China, um, <coughs> Bangladesh, you know, expands as well, so it pushes out. Uh, Japan becomes weirdly, you know, misshaped. Uh, yeah, yeah, US doesn't change too much, but you, you, you know, you see, Europe finally gets what it wants. It always wants to be um, more important than it is. But uh, some of these really do expand. Uh, so maybe I mentioned, I don't know if my name is Repita. So when, I was a, when we were kids in Australia, we had the, what was called the Jacaranda Atlas, and the equator was two-thirds of the way down the page. Which hemisphere made that map, right? So <laughs> it, was, it, was, it really was. And we're like, what's going on? Anyway, this was our standard you know, atlas that everyone would look at because there wasn't, this is before webs and things. And, and so Australia was all scrunched up and Greenland was three times as big as Australia, which it's the other way around. So that was wrong. Hemispherism, people, it's wrong. It won't change much, yeah. Yeah, so, so you could kind of argue the US doesn't change. It's going to get pushed and squished a little bit. Greenland is gone, right? Yeah. Yeah, I mean. Start out with a bias like Canada and Russia are not that big. Yeah, all these maps are messed up already. Yeah. So they're all wrong. On the new map, Canada would be small, right? Oh no. Take the yeah. Right? Yeah. Oh right, we didn't point out Russia actually. So Russia, you see, is going. Yeah, and so the um, oh, so hold on. No, so these are supposed to be hmm. no. So at the end, sorry, at the end, at the end, um, the area that you see, right? The area that you see reflects the population that's really there, right? Okay. That's, yeah, that's the point. So, so after these transformations, the area becomes visually the, the measure you're trying to, to show, right? Right, so the idea is, here's the story for it. So we're going to distort areas. So cartograms in general distort, they distort areas. So, uh, you know, other methods have been to, you know, the square one is just like, let's give up on shapes, right? Whatever. Um, and the other, you know, other methods are like you actually break them all apart and kind of separate them and then maybe you could grid them and squeeze them and stuff like that. So you still, you know, but people have got themselves in knots about maps forever because, you know, the whole sphere thing is a problem and then um, you know, the cartogram piece is hard too because, you know, you're going to bust up the visual information in some way. So spreading a repulsion, it's, an, it's just, diff so this is the classic diffusion story, right? Um, where things spread, it, if there's a slope, right, then it starts to even itself out. Um, you know, random walks, we've talked about this, it's all part of the same story. Uh, yeah, so we're going to diffuse, and so they, you have to do a clever thing of tracing how the um, boundaries move, right, so you have to remember that, and then you can redraw it all. Um, yeah, and then you make the, the surrounding part uh, equalize so that, because otherwise it would, could just spread out forever and slop off the thing or something like that. Yeah. 
Or if you made it high density, you know, if you sort of made the numbers too high, it wouldn't move at all. So then you can start to make, right, where you have data, you can just make any of these plots, right? Yes. These are not going to be fun plots, sorry. Um, no, right. You're trying to, you, it, all it, it constrains what sort of comes out at the end, you know, in terms of boundaries and so on, but it's going to be distorted, right? So it's always going to be distorted. This, these have been compelling kinds of maps, you know, people, you know, use them around the world. I don't know if the UN has used them, but they, you know, they, they, have, they have some hit to them. Right, so child mortality, uh, energy consumption, right, so these things are going to jump back and forth, right, so then the US is different, so Alaska gets, you know, it's part of the team, right, so it's going to get, um, I'm not sure what happened to Hawaii, actually. Oh, yeah. I don't know if they just let that one. They squeezed it a bit. No, that's a bit bitter. That's, it's been adjusted, right? It's a bit fatter. So that's pretty similar. GDP, you can see, you know, Japan and France, you know, Europe sort of pop up some more. Um, you have to concentrate sometimes to sort of figure out where things are, right? Canada just completely vanished in this one. Astr you know, Australia is this distorted. That's, that's Australia. Um, so these are these are, right. So there's this thing called World Mapper, and uh, yeah, it was a PNAS paper. It's, it's it's a cool thing. I do wonder. Well, I think maybe for the so this is still a hard problem, right? I mean, I imagine you could if you have the you could also not just have a map, but have a Google Earth version of it, where you let the diffusion happen on a sphere, and then move you know move around. Okay. Uh, yeah. There's a point to this, but it's a it's a you know how do we do this? Yeah. What's that? Yeah, uh, just in respect of some people ask questions. So does it look messed up? Yes. Uh, algorithmically speaking, um, all you got to do is you, you, wherever you are on the current surface, so all you, you got to do is say just on the surface of this surface, uh, the surface of the surface, right? Uh, you put an orthogonal coordinate system, right? And you just define, so the diffusion equation there, that's the Laplace operator. So any orthogonal coordinate system, actually even non-orthogonal ones, you can turn that into a differential operator. I do think the 3D version would be powerful because essentially we don't look at globes enough. People are very confused. Of, I mean, maps inherently confuse people as to where things are. I mean, like looking at the, you know, the Earth from the North Pole, you get a very different sense of Russia and the US and Canada. I mean, it's just seems very weird, right? You could also turn it upside down. Mm. There are lots of, there's uh, the Peters projection was a, sort of a controversial, it was equal area, I think, what they were trying to do with that. There's the Mac Peters projection, which has Scotland as just being enormous. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so this is this sort of a, that's a bit of a side thing, but it, um, you know, maps are unbelievably important. I wish we had a whole course on maps. Um, we have the GIS people here, Giles O'Neill, done, and be good to incorporate um, uh, his his stuff with the complex system center. We're trying to talk about that actually. Okay, so this is a distortion based on um, uh, so taking those original Voronoi cells, right, the thing that we saw uh, right back at the start, this was the, let me dangerously try to go back to that, no, yeah, so this picture, so take this picture and now diffuse things um, so that maybe you want the area to show um, the, the, the actual density of the population, you know, the area of the box of this Voronoi cell after diffusion to represent the density or the density to the two-thirds, where it's, I'm talking about the population density. Let's see if we can get this to work. And, you know, the, the point is that if you do this one is um, population has been equalized, right, so each one of these little cells now has an equal population in it, or each, each area represents a, um, its population, and then each area here represents population of the two-thirds. And so you see it equalizes well there. So this is this equalization story. 
Again, it's like an equal distribution of things, right? Okay. And, you know, the point is that this looks better. I mean, just to the eye, right? Just to the eye, these look like similar sized cells. Yeah. So, okay. And you can even look at the uh, angles within those cells, right? And so this is a whole madness, but you can see that the somewhat, these are the interior angles of all these Voronoi cells, that they set, they're, they're obviously broadly distributed, but they center around 120 degrees, which is what you would get inside a hexagon, right? Hexagons are the great way of, uh, it's true. <laughs> we will have a spiritual moment with, with hexagons later on. Um, so that's pretty cool, hexagons, people. You need a t-shirt, yeah. Hmm. So, all right, so let's see if we can derive this, you know, just sort of step through it um, with a different thing, because this is something we'd like to be able to do, sort of taking everything as a whole. And there's a, there's a, a couple of nice clever pieces in here, right? So, again, we want to minimize the average distance um, from, from a random individual to the nearest facility. Uh, this is the Voronoi diagram that we throw down. Right, you could just throw all this, the, the, these points down, all these facilities, and then your nearest place gives you a Voronoi diagram. Uh, we're going to have some population density. Um, and it's fixed. It's not moving around. You know, that's a very small, weird problem. It's a Z-LaTeX problem. My yeah. god. I can't believe it. It's unbelievable. It won't do max min right. properly. OK, so that should be, it should be min, yeah. It's a slash min in the thing, but there's a, I thought I got them all. So weird. Yeah, that would be where you, where you hate your population. <laughs> well, you put all your factories in China. There you go. Yeah. So that's a, yeah, that's a, that's a method, right? <laughs> Did I get that right? You're the politics guy. Economics? Okay. So, uh, <laughs> so you've got these facilities, N of them. Sorry, people. Uh, you've got some density, and, and so this, is a, this is, may look a little crazy, but we're going to integrate over the whole thing, which is a, sort of think of as a continuum. You've got some, uh, this is this uh, density function, and at each little cell, right, so we're, some we're in 2D, this is written as a potentially arbitrary thing, but we're in some little, there's some point here, this is x, um, and this is you know, x plus uh, dx in this direction, let me write it as 2d just to make it okay. So this is going to be x1, x2, and this will be um, x1 plus dx1, comma, x2 plus dx2, right? So we're in some little box here. There's uh, a nearest facility over here, right? So we imagine we're in some Voronoi cell, whatever it is, it's not right. Uh, so everyone in this little point, so this is some vector from an origin. What are these things? Uh, right, so there's some zero point here. We've got some coordinate system. And uh, all of these characters in here, they have some distance from them to the nearest facility. And so this may be, let's call this one, uh, and I guess I've used that notation a bit liberally. All right, okay. That's probably going to be confusing. Let's call this um, let's call this system Y's, right? There's just a Y space here, and um, very nice. And then we'll have this is facility one. This is facility two is over here, whatever it is. Um, and these characters in here decide that or, or figure out that they uh, this is the closest facility. Uh, there are other facilities everywhere. So they're going to look around and say, what's the minimum distance over these n facilities? And then that gets plugged in here, right? So this just means the distance from x to xi. I guess I made a mess of that. All right. Okay. What's happening? Yeah, so the three boxes um, should be min. Let's fix it, people. 
what is this? Supply networks, free, basic idea. So min, there it is. Look at that. So we'll replace it with text normal min. Min should be fine. Still. Okay. Are there any more of those? Okay. Fine. And it'll take an hour to fix up. <laughs> okay, so it's minimum. So does this make sense? So so this is a bit of a funny function, right? Because it's a it's an integral that should all be fine, but we've got a minimum inside it over n things, which is a you know, not a delight though, right? And it means that as you move around, as you move around, and I know this should be x. Oh, God, I'm terrible. This is this is just x. Um, as you move around, you're wandering around here, as you cross that boundary, suddenly this one becomes the closest one, right? So there's this switch. Um, and there's some area in this, uh, for this cell as well, right? So if you're sitting inside this cell, as you wander around, this, we kind of had something like this the other day, the area for x, that function, is going to be constant throughout here because it's the area of the cell you're in. And as you cross this boundary, there's going to be these sharp transitions, right? Discontinuities. Uh, at uh, cell boundaries for all these functions that we're interested in. Does this sort of make sense? Okay, P medium problem in um, uh, computer science. It's actually an MP hard problem if you want to do this. So, yeah, so it's not great, but we can always do pretty well with these things. We can either lie or steal or do something, um, and that's what we'll do. So there's an approximate solution really due to uh, Gusein Zaid, Zaid, and I actually, I have that paper because of um, Sci-Hub. Sci-Hub? Do you guys know what Sci-Hub is? Yes? Yes? Free the, free the words. Um, free the, I the ideas. Okay, so th I'll probably go to jail for showing this, but um, uh, is she from Kazakhstan or? Okay. So here it is, right? It's just a thing. For some reason, it's housed in Belize um, and various other places. But you, you just put in a... Generally, you have to put in a name of a thing, you know, like the title, and it will find it for you. And everyone wants to sue her, and they're like, you know, we sh you should... What's that? Paywalls. You know, and it's easy to get these things at your own library. Of course, it's not. Sorry. Which one, the crow? Oh, that thing? Oh, nothing. Ah, gave it away. <laughs> it's actually, it is a monogram, actually. Yeah, but it's a thing that no one has ever, ever asked about. So there you go. Um, but it's sitting, I have it everywhere, right? It's just a little thing. That's just my little glyph. I just thought I had to, have, it was Prince, really. It's, it's because of Prince. I kind of realized that Prince passed away, and I'm like, I think I have a thing because he did. Anyway, <laughs> sorry. What does MP Say it again. What does MP oh, um, okay. So it means if you do, if you, so, uh, so this is computer science, and you can correct me if it's wrong. So it can't be done, in, I mean, it's, it's, Technically right, it can't be done in polynomial time, right, with, with the scale of the thing. I know that's not right, but as you increase the size of the system, yeah. your ability to solve it goes up, you know, nastily, exponentially. Who wants to say the right thing? So, all right. So there's, there's a class of problems called P, which means there exists a polynomial time algorithm to solve it. So there's a class of problems called NP that means there is no known polynomial time algorithm to solve that. So if there isn't one, it means there's no known one. NP hard means at least as hard as the hardest problems in NP. NP complete means you're in NP and not in P, unless P and NP are the same thing. It is not known whether P and NP are the same thing. That's one of the great unsolved it is. mathematics. Like one of the Millennium Prize problems is does P equal NP. And it draws crazy people out. Though occasionally you get a papers that all appear, or there'll be a story. Someone has proved that P equals MP. Yeah. 
But it, it's a big deal if you prove P equals MP, right? Because it means that all these map problems can be mapped, because they can all be mapped often into each other. You re reconstruct, yeah, and then it means a lot of things will be faster. They could have a huge prefactor, because basically, you know, time to solve is some number times n to some power. Yeah. Uh, right. But MP hard ones, I mean, th there's always. Right, a, a good heuristic for getting a long way. So that's kind of what we'll do, but we'll do it mathematically. Did we describe things? Okay. Okay. So, um, yeah. So, uh, so we've got, we're going to place them down, we're going to have this Voronoi cells, and then we're going to try to figure out uh, what's the best way to lay them out. So we're going to have the same thing as before. So area is the area of the Voronoi cell containing x. Um, and we'll say this as well. So this is where the fudge comes in, actually. Um, for a particular Voronoi cell, then as those cells of the same shape scale, then the average distance to the nearest source with it, you know, for all the population inside that cell will scale as a to the half. And there'll be some shape prefactor. And the, the this is really the one thing that you need to do to make this work out. Just replace that with a C. So all these cells are different shapes, right? You've got all these little Voronoi cells. They're all going to be slightly different. So this is not right, but it's a good rough thing to do. Um, it's pretty good. I mean, def you know, the big thing that's happening is as area goes up, you know, this, this is, that's the driving uh, piece in, in how, you know, well, we'll talk about time, but average distance to the nearest facility. That's the big story. So it's a small approximation. So now you have this, um, right? So this thing that we're trying to minimize is uh, this quantity, which is, right? So we're going to integrate over the, you can think of it as a probability density, if you like, if, or, but it's the uh, you know, population density times a to the half. And this is now a special function, which is, it's the, area of the cell, Voronoi cell that you're in, right? And there are going to be n of these cells because there are n facilities. There are going to be n of these cells. This quantity, this function is constant and then changes, right? Um, so we also have this. And th this is a nice uh, little bit of work mathematically. I mean, just sort of in terms of setting these things, things up, it's a nice thing to think about. The sum of those areas have to be the area of the whole region. And then we can turn that into a constraint, into a nice mathematical constraint. So this is well done, right? So this is the integral over um, the whole region, one over the area. So what happens is, as you integrate across here, right? You imagine breaking your integral into uh, all the, the n regions. As you integrate across here, this is a constant inside that region. So you can pull it out, right? So for for the jth region, right? So imagine that's this cell, right? It's got some area, and we'll write this is a j for that region. So as we integrate over that dx, and this is just over, let's call this this part of it um, omega i. As we integrate over that section, this is just a constant, and we can pull it out. So it's one over a j, and then it's just the integral over that region, this is, should be j's, sorry, j's, and then we're just integrating over region j, and the integral, right, we're just integrating over, so that's just the area. So that is, again, aj over aj, so it's 1. Right, so that means when we go over all of these, you know, we break it into n things, each one contributes 1, so we get n as a total. Right, so this is a way of saying, given this kind of function, this, this peculiar function, um, <coughs> it's, it's a way of getting our n in there, our, our constraint on the number of facilities. Obviously something we can dial up and down. Okay. It's a clever little thing to do. Right. So that means you can set this up. And basically you've seen things like this, but now it's uh, uh, calculus of variations. Uh, so it's the same sort of, sort of setup as Lagrange multipliers, but we're trying to minimize this thing, and we have some constraint function, which we rewrite as n minus that integral, the 1 over a integral. 
All right. These things work in a, I'm pressing the wrong thing, calculus of variations. And then, um, don't have to worry too much, but basically it's a functional derivative story. Uh, when you, we're going to uh, vary all possible configurations, right? We're going to allow for essentially all placements of these facilities. And as we do that, our area function changes, right? It, it moves around. If we move this facility just a little bit this way, then the Voronoi cells change and the area function changes. Uh, but calculus of variations essentially turns into something where you go through and you differentiate with respect to the function that we're interested in. So we're going to differentiate inside this with respect to A, right? This is a uh, del del A thing. So A to the half becomes A to the minus a half, and there's a half here. So this is the same as, it looks exactly the same as the uh, uh, Stefan's treatment, a, the A to the minus 2 as well. And you have to set the integral to be 0. So undoing all these things, we get that same story again. The row population is um, proportional to A to the minus 3 halves. And now, you know, this is, it's really the same thing, but it's been done in this kind of global way. And, and So this seems pretty solid, right? And the same sort of things as before, um, where we row faci the facility density is one over the local area. So we put that in. Uh, and then we get this 2 thirds scaling again. And if you want, you can normalize it properly and do all sorts of things. But basically, it's all there. OK? Right? This is normalized such that uh, if you integrate over this thing, this is just some constant on the bottom, but if you integrate over the whole area, then this blob is the same as this blob. You get 1 and you get n, right? Because we need the total density to be, the total number of pop, um, facilities to be 1. All right, that's cool. That's a nice thing, but basically the same as Stefan's, really. But it didn't have, we didn't have to do this, uh, see, it, it turns out to be the same looking thing. However, the explanation that Stefan had for this part, this, this, this piece over here, was about maintenance of the facility. We don't, ha we don't have anything like that here. We just, this is just a constraint on the number of facilities. So it, it kind of functions in the same way, but it has a better feel to the whole thing. Much better. OK. OK, so there are a couple more pieces, and I'll talk about a little bit, but I think we can get to this. And then we're going to go to public versus private. So all of this has been about putting facilities so that the average you know, burden on your average person is as small as possible. But then you might want to shift out to your Starbucks or whatever you want. You, know, you, you, know, you sort of care about that, but you really care about the number of people that come in the door. And so that becomes a different constraint. So that's after this bit. So imagine we've got all these facilities. How do we redistribute you know, people if, you know, with planes and all these sorts of things, which is what we do, right? Cars and so on. Uh, the mail, whatever it is, you know, FedEx, Amazon's worried about this incredibly, right? They've thought about how to get things to people. Um, FedEx is big, where is it? Does anyone know? Uh, is it in Memphis or is that maybe it, maybe UPS? Um, But I believe one of them has things like they have planes in the air just flying around for, from a resilience point of view. So if something goes wrong with something, they can actually redirect that one. Like it's worth their money to put stuff up in the air so they can respond. I mean, it's really interesting. OK. So this is, again, Gassner and Newman. It's a great body of work they produced. Uh, Newman, was, Newman, who's still in Michigan, um, and was at SFI for a long time. Gassner was his graduate student. So uh, well, how are we going to get these things to people, right? So we sort of talked about, you know, your local uh, distribution, but somehow you're moving stuff either between these places, um, then for that kind of local distribution. So, so there's the maintenance of the places, there's the travel time, and the travel time is the thing that they kind of introduced. This, it's just a little toy model idea, but basically there's a tunable parameter, delta, which goes between 0 and 1, and, and there are these two pieces that can concern you. One is how far each trip is, right? Because now imagine taking a plane, right? And we're going to take 
And of course, this is sort of set up like this. You, do you want to just take um, you know, no connecting, right? Just, just one flight. I'm OK with up to two flights. I'm OK with up to three flights. Um, and essentially, the hub structure of the US is, has solved the problem of complete, right? I, ideally, you'd have a plane that goes from your place to wherever else in the US. That would be good. But um, that would be incredibly expensive, right? Fully connected network. That would be great. But um, you can get not far away from that with just a few you know, hubs located around. So this is how much you care about how long it takes or how much distance it is. But you might really not, or you might like, be happy with hops or not like them, right? So you could, this could be, if this is a one, then you don't care about this, but you really care about the number of stops. Okay. And so, you know, this is a simulation result. I think this is a good place to get to. This is a simulation result. So uh, at zero, you don't care about hops but you care about distance, so, um, so the hops are not really a problem to you. So you start to see something that looks a little more like what you know, a road or a, uh, a railway type thing might be, right? So it's fairly uniform grid. This is based on the underlying population distribution for the US. Dialing it up, so now you care about hops, you start to see hubs appear. Um, right, because the, these are, these back here, this is, all, these, all of these little stops, you're not worried about, right? They're not impinging on your time. You're actually maybe just moving through them easily. They're painless. Uh, but now this is a world where it's painful to go through these transitional hubs. So you want to go through as few as possible. This actually has, you know, sort of infinite resolution in theory, right? It keeps going into uh, more and more little tendrils of, of hubs uh, of, of, of uh, the network. But yeah, New York sort of comes up. Orlando's big. Dallas is big, Nashville, Tennessee, so maybe it's Nashville. Uh, and then as you dial that further up, you start to see, so Chicago's there, Kansas City, Atlanta. I mean, these are, of course, real actual hubs. And then at that limit, it's Cincinnati is the center of everything, as you um, presumably knew. Um, and then this is the, you know, this is the, the, the thicknesses of the flux of things. But it's sort of true, right? I mean, the, the weight of people is very much on this side, yeah? Um, and then you know, there's a few around here, right? So, but if you got it, if you dial the thing to that limit where you're really worried about uh, the number of stops between places, it's going to look like that. Uh, but it means you know you you know you're going to travel further distances, right? You're going to do these sorts of things, yeah. Whereas back here, you'd basically you know be able to go fairly straightly through it, yeah. So that's that's a beautiful bit of work. Um, and I think, so we'll talk about this, the supply to the most is the next thing, right? So it's coffee instead of actually being, well, it's important for humanity, but um, <laughs> very, very important. Um, anyway, so uh, that, that'll be the next thing. And yes, and then we'll get onto networks actually, which is a huge story, huge story. Lots of things to tell you. Okay, all right, thank you. Projects.